Good evening. Uh, we'll wait just another minute or two to uh, get a few more people here. Okay, I think we've got enough uh, people here that we can get started. Welcome to Intersections, Equity, Environment in the City. If you've attended the award ceremony this afternoon, there will be a little bit of repeated information, but thank you for coming. And uh, I imagine we have a few new faces here. This is an event hosted collaboratively by the Boston Society for Architects, knowledge communities, including Women in Design and Boss Noma. My name is Marin Braco. I'm one of the co-chairs of the WID Symposium Committee, which is just one of the many Women in Design subgroups. WID is a multifaceted interdisciplinary community focused on creating opportunities for networking, professional development, continuing education, mentorship, and community recognition. And I'm Ali Horowitz, president of Boss Noma. Boss Noma's mission is to foster the advancement of equitable practice and minority leadership through outreach, strategic partnerships, and investing in the next generation of minority designers. We're going to provide a brief introduction of the symposium before we jump into our keynote. Without our connection to ABX this year and the constraints of being in a convention center and one place in one day, uh, we had the chance to completely rethink our format, which led to this hybrid multi-day event happening over the course of this week and to our collaboration with Boss Noma. We're delighted to have so many people here with us this evening to kick it off. The content of the symposium will explore the convergence of structures, identities, and the built environment through the lens of Boston's past, present, and future. In a statement addressing racial injustice in the profession, the Boston Society for Architecture charged architects and designers with understanding the roles we play in perpetuating systems of oppression, and in doing so, committing ourselves to designing and building for equity. We must examine our responsibility to create lasting change. Our actions and inactions within systems, firms, and professional organizations contribute to the systemic inequities that continue to exist. Structural injustices and systemic inequities start at the policy level and pervade all aspects of the built environment through recurrent design. Planning, urban design, and development policies create our built environments, affect our natural ecological world, shape our communities, and impact our collective health. These deeply rooted problems undermine our efforts to create a better world and they must be designed out. Each virtual session, in-person workshop, and site tour We'll tease out a thread in the larger fabric of Boston's built environments by focusing on the role of architects and designers in amplifying equitable solutions through issues in housing, lighting, transportation, and public spaces. Our panelists and presenters represent a diversity of backgrounds and expertise, and their varied perspectives highlight the importance of intersectionality and approaching inequities from a holistic view. Collectively, these case studies and conversations exemplify paths toward an environmentally and socially conscious Boston. Thank you, Ali. I'd also like to express my gratitude to the sponsors of this event. This year, we've received funding from Feingold Alexander Architects, Perkins & Will, Icon Architecture, Sasaki, Lead Kennedy, Util, Landscape Forms, and Mikyam Kim Design. And we'd also like to thank our partners, A Better City, Design Museum Everywhere, and BSLA, the Boston Society of Landscape Architects. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this event is taking place uh, all throughout this week, running through Friday the 12th. Uh, it's a mix of both in-person and virtual events. I'm going to quickly walk you through the format. Uh, for the full schedule, you can go to the website, which has a lot of details on each event. Uh, we can drop that in the chat. Uh, so we had a sort of soft opening this Saturday. This is a collaboration with uh, BSLA, the Boston Society of Architects. Uh, we had a couple of great site tours. Uh, so thank you for anyone that joined that session. Uh, we had uh, organizations leading those site tours from Perkins and Will, Livable Streets, BSLA, Stoss Landscape Urbanism, and Niche Engineering. 
We also had our award ceremony this afternoon. Um, and tonight we kick off like the real content of uh, the symposium with the keynote and then going into this week of presentations and workshops. So during sort of each day, Monday through Friday, you'll have a lunchtime virtual session noon to 1.30. Uh, there's two mid-afternoon events on Wednesday and Friday. Those are 2.30 to 4. Uh, and then in the evenings, we have a mix of both virtual and in-person. So that includes an ex exhibit opening and an interactive workshop held at the BSA. And we end with an in-person happy hour and site tour in Jamaica Plain. Today, uh, as I said, we've had the uh, awards lunch this afternoon. Um, what's incredible is a lot of those award winners were actually, they're all uh, part of the symposium in other ways, which is totally serendipitous, but um, really incredible women. Um, and then tonight we have our keynote. Uh, that will be a conversation between three incredible panelists and moderated by one of our uh, WID co-chairs that I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, but before we get into that, I just want to speak to a couple of logistics. Um, so if you have any questions, put those in the Q&A box, not in the chat box during the session, and then we will uh, make sure we have time at the end for those questions. And if you have any technical issues during the session, we have a BSA host uh, on hand. Her name is Madeline Hikes, and this is her phone number here. Uh, you can also chat. Okay. And so now I will um, briefly introduce our moderator, Rowan El Safar. Uh, she is one of our fellow WID Symposium co chairs, as I mentioned. Uh, she's a landscape architect, researcher, and doctoral candidate at Harvard Graduate School of Design. Her work lies at the intersection of landscape, infrastructure, and human ecology. Rowan holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from the Rhode Island School of Design and a master's degree in landscape architecture and design studies from Harvard Graduate School of Design. She will be moderating tonight's conversation and uh, I'll let her introduce the panel. Thank you, Erin. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure this evening to serve as moderator for the keynote panel, which kicks off uh, the symposium. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce three extremely knowledgeable panelists today. They all have very long and impressive records of publications, projects, research, and policy on issues of equity and the environment. Let me first briefly tell you who the panelists are, and then we will that we will then they will then introduce their work, and afterwards we'll have a discussion as it pertains to the symposium's main themes, and then at the end there will be time uh, for Q and A from the audience. Um, so our first panelist um, is Billy Fleming, who's the Wilkes Family Director of the Ian McCark Center and teaches at the Weitz Weitzman School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also a senior fellow with Data for Progress and co-director co of the Climate and Community Project, which works to connect the demands of the climate justice movement to the policy development process. His writing on climate disaster and design have been published in City Lab, The Guardian, Houston Chronicle, and Landscape Journal, among others. Prior to joining Penn, he worked as landscape architect, city planner, organizer, and later in the Obama administration's White House Domestic Policy Council. Fleming's work is also focused on, the inter is focused on the intersection of climate change and design and the relationship between design and public policy. Uh, our second panelist is Keller Easterling, who's an architect, urbanist, writer, and the Enid Storm Dwyer Professor of Architecture at Yale. Easterling brings her unique experience examining global infrastructure and the relationship between architecture and the larger systems that dictate where and when architecture might exist. She is a prolific author and theorist. Her recent book, Extra Straight Statecraft, The Power of Infrastructure Space, examines global infrastructure as a medium of polity. Easterling is a 2019 United States Artist Fellow in Architecture and Design. She's also the recipient of the 2019 Blueprint Award for Critical Thinking. And last but not least, uh, Kenneth Bailey is the co-founder of the Design Studio for Social Intervention. His interests focus on the research and development of design tools for marginalized communities to address complex social issues. With over three decades of experience in community practice, Bailey brings a unique perspective on the ethics of design in relation to community engagement, the arts and cultural action. His new book entitled Ideas, Arrangements, Effects, Systems Design and Social Justice 
uses diverse examples from, from his practice and other practices to offer readers a roadmap for using social intervention and into imagining and creating a more just and vibrant world. Um, and with that, uh, I think Billy will uh, present some of his work. Great, thanks so much, Rowan. Thanks for, for having us. Um, thanks to everyone at BSA, BSLA for, for putting this together. It's such an honor to, to be here with you. Um, to be here with uh, with Kenny and Keller as well. Let me get a, a quick little bit of text sorted here because I'm sure you're seeing presenter mode. Let me flip that. Uh, two years into this, still have not completely figured this out. Let me drag this over. Okay. Um, anyway, okay, yeah. So thank you again for having me. Uh, I'm going to talk really quickly because I know we want to leave some time um, for conversation at the end of this. Uh, so I'm going to focus less on kind of the full sprawling bit, bits of work that. Uh, I've led around sort of climate justice in the GND within the McCarg Center over the last few years, uh, and just focusing on a, a few particular aspects of it. So the kind of set of related programs, studios, uh, scholarship, and some what people might call like action research, um, all of which are aimed at sort of realigning the design professions around uh, the demands of the climate justice movement, uh, and sort of as a result, beginning to think about how to merge the scale, scope, and pace uh, that policy offers and political economy provide with the, with the other things that designers do well, um, thinking, drawing, uh, and otherwise sort of working through some of the most difficult questions uh, that's around things like the implementation or realization of a just energy transition or the realization of a green new deal or a red deal or a red, black, and green new deal as it's um, now been called. So the story at least for us sort of begins here in September, 2019, although there were, there were the better part of a year, year and a half or so of work that went into planning this, but um, begins um, with uh, a for now former colleague at Penn who's now out in California at Berkeley, Dana Donna Cohen, uh, and Kate Aronoff, uh, a journalist now based at the New Republic, um, to begin pulling this event together, designing the Green New Deal. Some of you may have been here, uh, one of the most sort of packed events I think I've ever been a part of. Um, we crammed about 14 or 1,400 or so people into this tiny little, well, not, not so tiny auditorium on campus in Philly. Uh, and did so for a few reasons. One of those was to create some literal space for leaders from the climate justice movement. So some of the folks you see on stage here in this slide, uh, Kareen Taylor, who uh, is now a senior leadership at We Act in New York, David Roberts, climate journalist, formerly at Vox, Brianna Gunn Wright uh, at the Roosevelt Institute, Leah Stokes uh, at UC Santa Barbara, and then a couple of our faculty here, Allison Lasseter and Ellen Nysith, um, to put them into conversations and to begin to have some of these hard conversations about um, not only how to win the broad strokes of a Green New Deal, but what it might mean to think about um, the, some of these harder questions of implementation and what we might be able to offer to this movement um, to help other people see themselves in their community in the kind of world that Green New Dealers intend to build. And in many ways, this event was always kind of imagined as a way to both steer this particular institution, which is very small state conservative, University of Pennsylvania, um, and others in our orbit, the rest of the Design Academy, and maybe even the rest of the design profession, into a set of conversations that otherwise may never have sort of penetrated the mainstream of our field. Um, and I think, you know, we can talk about whether or not this event is, was the or one of the, the many sort of things that made that possible. Um, but in many ways, I think it's it's easy to look back at this event as wildly successful in that sense. Um, I'll talk about some of the other things that came out of it here in just a moment, but one of those that some of you may have been involved in was something called the Green New Deal Super Studio, which just wrapped up over the summer, was a lovely collaboration between the McCarg Center, the Landscape Architecture Foundation, uh, at the American Society of Landscape Architects and many others, and solicited, you know, on the order of about 700 or so um, different submissions in what was very explicitly not a competition. It was a cooperative effort to begin thinking through how to build up the visual library, again, of the kind of world that redo dealers might want to build. Um, and to use that as a way to de, uh, de-emphasize or de-radicalize uh, that kind of world in the mainstream sort of, sort of public view. So how do we think about a very radical proposal suddenly seeming more pragmatic by giving it spatial form and aesthetic and otherwise doing the things that design do? One of the other things that came out of this event was uh, a series of conversations with some of the folks you saw. That was Roshini Prakash in the image before this, the one of the founders and executive director of the Sunrise Movement. Um, so she, many others kind of in, in her orbit, uh, and I uh, began having conversations about how we could make this particular institution uh, useful to them. Um, so what do we do with the resources, platform power available to us? Um, and how do we think about using it in ways that advance the cause of climate justice as, as they've defined it for us? 
Um, one of those, sort of the simplest one, was to take this um, sprawling constellation of climate and built environment data that sits behind paywalls or is otherwise scattered across the internet and mostly inaccessible to anyone without an EDU email address and assemble it, uh, put it into an atlas, hopefully make it beautiful enough that people would want to spend like three hours sifting through maps and GIFs and other things. So that's what you have to do to actually do this. Um, but to use that as a way, uh, in their words, to give their, their chapters, their groups, their hubs, whatever their sort of distributed organizing model might be, uh, a set of tools that they could build campaigns around, they could organize direct actions around, that could otherwise advance their work on the ground. And I, I think every day I'm surprised by um, both how many people have engaged with this and what kinds of groups have range from uh, DSA chapters around the country to agriculture extension offices and sort of everything in between. Um, and in this sort of immediate sort of aftermath of that Atlas's publication was approached by a set of international students here uh, who rightfully said, cool, this is the US, interesting. Also the US is a tiny and significant part of the world and actually one of the biggest impediments to climate justice uh, when we're talking about this sort of scope of the planet. So what about the rest of the world? What are the global consequences uh, of realizing um, of the different sorts of realizations of a GND that might play out in the US. Uh, and so began with them a couple of years ago, a project that is basically an internationalist version of that uh, initial uh, GND atlas. Again, looking at things like biodiversity loss, which you see there, uh, looking at some of the sort of key elements uh, of the energy transition and the realization of a global GND, which in this case, is rare earth minerals. So these are speculative and active mine sites around the world. Um, and looking at some of the key technologies that would be assembled through some of the different policies. And again, thinking about how to put this in context so that literally anyone can find, can use, otherwise understand, engage with the material uh, in whatever way makes sense for them. Uh, and then also, I think, again, asking questions about where design fits into this. So looking at sort of key institution, institutions and instruments of implementation, in this case, foreign direct investment and uh, inter, intercontinental development banks. Um, many of which, as you can see here from this quick little vignette of France, tend to reproduce uh, all of the sort of colonial relations that sort of brought us to this moment. Uh, and then looking very explicitly here at the sort of state of global or contemporary global design practice. So uh, what looks like light pollution here is subnational GDP. Uh, what looks like blue circles here or, or purple circles here are uh, headquarters for global firms, for multinational firms. And then all of those spokes extending from them are their projects built around the world. And what this is really arguing is that uh, there's a political economy of the built environment. It very radically constrains what's possible in practice. And that with some exceptions, we're largely incapable of transcending the system. So what, what do we do with that? And for, for us in the center, I'm going I'm to wrap up here really quickly. Um, there's been sort of two thrusts here. One has been in studios to think through critical questions from a U.S. context of where do we start? What are the places that belong at the top of the list for implementation when we think about the realization of something like a Green New Deal? It's probably not the places of the surfeit of technical, political, and economic uh, or financial capacity. It's probably places that are historic sites of disinvestment, what are often called frontline or fenceline communities. So in that first version of a studio working through what the realization of, say, the GND's program might look like in Appalachia, um, how that realization might be messaged to people so that it's actually evident that the public sector is uh, investing in the material, you know, uh, improvement of their everyday lives versus trying to submerge that action. Um, and then working through a set of more specific sites in that region. So looking through what's often called the coal field to prison pipeline in Appalachia, which is a phenomenon in which uh, the very few slats of sort of flatland in Appalachia tend to be mountaintop removal sites. Um, those sites become, have become um, a primary site for prison building in the region, both because those are, well, because those sites are flat, um, because there's a, a huge trust of state and federal money to build explicitly prisons atop abandoned mine lands there, and third, because you do not have to clean up these sites to the same degree you would to put incarcerated people on top of them as you would for almost any other residential use. Um, and you can see here just a few quick vignettes of some of those sites um, and working with a number of groups in Appalachia, including Black in Appalachia, Reimagine Appalachia, uh, 100 Days in Appalachia, uh, all the groups of Appalachia in the title, um, began thinking through, okay, what does it look like to merge this uh, decarceration, uh, climate justice, and land back agenda through what would eventually become known as the Red, Black, and Green New Deal. Uh, and in their case, looking here at the conversion, the decommissioning of and conversion uh, of prison sites like USP Big Sandy or Letcher uh, into rural electric co-ops. And we can talk more about why, but the short answer is that they have the ability sort of today to power a town of about 2000 or so people in the region. 
And again, I'm always surprised to find out who is using this work and for, for what reasons. Uh, just last week, we found out our, our friends at um, Reimagine Appalachia were using this in some of their advocacy work uh, around the BIP and BBB stuff in DC. Um, and then now wrapping up um, really quickly, just this semester, I have a group of students now working on similar questions uh, in the Mississippi Delta around the plantation to prison pipeline. Uh, in this case, looking specifically at Angola or the um, Louisiana State Penitentiary, uh, Parchment, the Mississippi State Pen, and La Forche uh, in Thibodeau, Louisiana. And with a particular focus on all of the ways in which um, incarcerated labor, prison labor, convict leasing has been used to literally construct the built environment of the Gulf South. So in this case, looking at some specific elements, uh, specific contracts to build specific elements um, just outside of Thibodeau, um, looking uh, a bit more abstractly at some of the products that come out of the prison system there and how they are used to build things like dormitories, um, furnished housing, any kind of group housing. Uh, and then asking students to really sit with, I think one of the more important notes here uh, for us from Naomi Klein, which um, I'll just sort of read verbatim off the screen here. Uh, the interplay between lofty dreams and earthly victories has always been at the heart of moments of deep progressive transformation. And then in the US, those breakthroughs won for workers and their families after the Civil War and during the Great Depression, as well as civil rights and the environment in the 60s and early 70s were not just responses to crises and the demand from below, they were also the products of dreams of very different kinds of societies. Uh, dreams invariably dismissed as impossible and impractical at the time. And what set those moments apart was not the presence of crises of which we have no shortage, but that they were times of rupture when, that, when their utopian imagination was unleashed. And I'll just end by saying, you know, that work is now all being channeled into this, this, um, this group called the Climate and Community Project that Rowan mentioned. Uh, I won't spend much time on this because we can save that for the Q&A, but we'll just say, you know, that, that group, which is this really incredible co collection of junior um, activist scholars from around the world, uh, have been really thinking through how do, we, how do we treat the built environment and especially the public elements of the built environment, like schools and public housing, as key sites of investment for the realization of something like a Green New Deal. Um, and so it's produced a series of these different reports, which are nice, but have also resulted in a bunch of legislation. So there's a few different bills kind of finding their way through Congress. Uh, a few provisions of both the BIF and BBB are taken directly from both of these reports. Um, and it's been just like a whirlwind and I think a really heartening experience for me to, to be quite skeptical of what would be possible uh, in a place like this in the academy uh, and to just find a really incredible community of folks like Keller, like uh, Kenny and like Rowan and others out there in the world who are willing to do this work. So. Um, with that, I will stop talking uh, and turn it over to my colleague to sort of pick up from here. Which I think is Keller, right, Rowan? Yeah, that's right. Yes, hi, <laughs> sorry. Uh, thank you so much for, for inviting me. And um, uh, it's great to be here with Billy and Kenny, with whom I've worked in other places at other times. Um, uh, I'm a designer and a writer and a professor. And I research US and global urbanism and advocate for forms, spatial forms for direct action that may be effective within some emergent chemistries of power. I've written books on American regional landscapes and highways and suburbs, as well as global infrastructures, repeatable formulas or spatial products that have multiplied within the colonizing and globalizing periods of capital expansion, even contagious formulas for entire free zone world cities that are the engine rooms of neoliberalism, centers of labor and environmental abuse that have crafted their own exceptions from political consequence. And all of this is making a new layer of the earth's crust. I can't report that there's a single enemy in this soup. It's worse than that. It's a spectrum of dangers from capitalism and fascism and racism and whiteness and xenophobia and on and on. And humans have managed to pass on dangers to non-human biological and atmospheric agents. But we're sort of pressing beyond the rhetorical critique. Um, uh, you know, to ask if, if, if space is making some of the most radical changes to the globalizing world, how can designers position spatial practices and spatial variables to have 
uh, as much consequence as the anointed econometric, legal, and digital languages? And how can designers work in partnerships and coalitions that initiate change outside the client-based conventions of the profession? So beyond forms as shapes and outlines, we're designing forms of interplay. Culture usually thinks of innovation as the shiny new technology, the vaccine, the algorithm, but maybe innovation is the design of the way things go together. And it is the, then the quality of the mixtures and relationships between existing and emergent technologies that signal sophistication. Often these interplays are even working to put the development machine to reverse by reverse engineering the multipliers of abusive markets. A couple of examples. Um, uh, in the US, you know, we're now making a technology change to electric or automated vehicles, but more important than the technology is the Technology change is the relationship between technologies. And if, if cars are used in lieu of transit, they will create you know, unprecedented congestion. Um, but a second order change that orchestrates spaces of switching between infrastructures of different capacities has a chance of getting cars off the road decreasing sprawl and emissions and it's only the it's only the mixture of that interplay that has that special capacity so if you're thinking about interplay then you're not really thinking about um solutions solutions are kind of weak positions uh, there's more information in the interplay, in the entanglement of, of problems. Here's an example of an interplay that considers dismantling some of the financial multipliers of sprawl that are you know, at, at risk, flood and wildfire. It, it's asking what happens if you tie mortgage approval to climate values rather than thin financial abstractions and not on it's kind of like the rewired kidney donor networks that you may have heard of rather than grouping by the thousands grouping houses by the thousands and subdivisions or bundled subprimes what happens if you allow mortgage owners another degree of collectivity uh, and as they trade and reward group exchanges that reduce collective risk. So then a problematic risk in another arrangement might become a, a resource, maybe a counter contagion of sprawl that's authored by communities. Since we're really impatient for change and really sick of political impasses or compromises, just wondering, you know, with ideas like this, can designers offer some additional forms of direct action? Direct action is and should be marching, rioting, sabotaging, unionizing, legislating, and you know, all the rest of it. And we we link arms in all those efforts. But our policies and our monolithic dependence on capital has failed so utterly that is there a chance to pick up what's fallen off those? failed ledgers and begin to work now. Trafficked mortgage products that frequently fail, returning to land and to houses. So we're working on interplays to re-aggregate these resources in alternative land holding organs. This is in, in you know, in studio uh, experiments. Land holding organs like community land trusts, agrarian trusts, other forms of commoning that refuse the logics of property and guard against gentrification and dispossession. Given that stability, it's also easier to counter the automatic harm of thin financial abstractions with, with tangible, heavy, lumpy values to do with position and proximity and adjacency and sequencing and programming and solids and climate. 
design is often only removing obstructions to the incalculable productivity of these organizations that are alive, you know, the land and community that redoubles values, that, you know, that plants one seed and gets 10. And these are the very networks of, of mutualism and care and maintenance and kinship that are at the heart of indigenous black feminist, abolitionist thinking, and, and that potentially overwhelm the abuses of capital with rival markets of decommodified exchange that are embedded in space. And, and maybe this incalculable value can begin to address the also incalculable data of reparations. You're looking at, at this I can experimental scenario for interplay that has said the potentials of diverting funds from monoculture agriculture and monoculture policing into uh, an unusual community land trust that mixed um, urban and rural land in uh, Minneapolis. And another uh, that looks at agrarian trusts for aggregating exhausted farmland for renewable energy and reparations. You know, if even a percentage of designers facilitated reorganization of land and community land trusts, you know, this forum that started by civil rights activists in the 60s in Georgia that then spread around the world, it would utterly change the complexion of, of politics. And in, in some ways, we don't need to wait for permission or legislation or capital or a moment of political purity. We can do that right now with a rewired, rewiring interplay or rearrangement of resources that we have in our hands. So direct action of this sort in the language of space, maybe it also offers stealthy, non-lexical, undeclared ways to reach cross political divides or build you know, solidarity that makes it harder for political superbugs like Trump to succeed. Nothing works and no, no one thing works, no solutions, but rather than searching for solutions and universals and elementary particles, this planetary solitarity of the pluriverse is maybe looking for, for the patchy and the partial that's multiplied by many times. So I'll stop there and uh, And pass on to Kenny. Did you stop your share? Yeah, we can see. Oh, your that's screen. me sharing. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, hello, everyone. Um, it's so fun to be here with Keller and Billy. Um, I'm Kenneth Bailey. I'm here in Boston. I work at the Design Studio for Social Intervention. Um, we've been around for about 15 years. Um, we exist to help the social justice, social change sector imagine new ways to solve social problems. Um, and uh, Maybe about a year, year and a half ago, we did a big event there at BSA on spatial justice, where we invited Caesar McDowell and um, Alvaro Lima from the BPDA. And we um, had our colleague, Rachel Hahn come in town from London, um, who's a sonographer um, and a, a scenographic theorist, all to do a series of fast rapid workshops on the propagation of spatial justice. And um, it was a blast. And I'm so happy to be back here um, with old friends at BSA. It feels like, I mean, it's our backyard. So we're, we're always hanging out with these guys and so happy to be thought of again. Um, what do we do? How do we work? So we do a lot of placemaking. Um, we do social intervention design. We do technical assistance. We write a lot. Um, you can find writing on our, some of the writing that we've done on spatial justice on our website. Um, we do um, artist residencies and fellowships. Um, and we work a lot with um, city um, governments to help them um, with resident engagement around urban um, space and transportation and the like. To give you some examples of some of the work we've done recently, um, a year ago, and then again, this last weekend, we've been doing these festivals called In Public. And the premise of these festivals really is um, um, the heart of the city 
and a lot of public spaces inside of Boston um, are typically programmed by, for the white imaginary. I think that would be the cleanest way to say it. And, um, and we were really interested in sort of creating the opportunity for artists and um, placemakers of color to have the resources and opportunity to program um, the heart of the city in different ways and um, invited artists to program the city, to program the, the heart of um, downtown Boston. And in a way, um, we worked with sort of the hard arrangements of the steps in the middle of downtown Boston and the soft arrangements of lots of communities moving through that space um, because it's one of the, the veins of the city, one of the, the, the big arteries of the city where people move back and forth with particularly communities of color to give people a reason to stop and, and enjoy themselves and uh, be able to claim the space in ways that don't necessarily apply to the market um, and to create what we're interested in, in terms of counter atmospheres, atmospheres that um, we feel center um, people of color and center laughter, interaction, dialogue, and the like. And um, we recently, um, well, this weekend did the did in public 2021 again. And here are some images from that. Um, the um, we um, hired um, uh, people of color artists and um, placemakers to choreograph the space. The theme was around tending to space and how do we heal together in the twin um, um, pandemics of state sanctioned violence and COVID, um, and how do we tend to each other in this time right now, and. Um, other than that, the other thing I wanted to say is um, we recently wrote a book um, called Ideas, Arrangements, Effects, System Design and Social Justice. Um, the premise is that ideas about the world aren't floating in the sky. They're embedded in our built environments and they're embedded in our cultures and they're embedded in the way we speak to each other. Um, and those things we refer to as arrangements, those hard and soft um, things that we take for granted in our everyday lives, how we proceed with each other, the relationships that we assume towards each other um, are part of how ideas about the world come to life. And a lot of the social problems that we're interested in changing really come out of those arrangements. And so if we are interested in social justice, social change, we have to be interested in how um, we construct built environments, how we construct programs of social interaction, how we construct programs of the everyday, um, inspect them and start to imagine um, new ones, which really I think lines up a lot with what Billy and Keller were saying is as people who think about design, as people who think about relation, as people who think about um, change, um, we really have an opportunity right now in this climate to propose new worlds. And I think what we were trying to get at here in this book is some practical ways to think about those propositions and some techniques with which to um, dismantle the arrangements of, the so of social life that we currently are occupied with. So with that, I'll stop and um, let us talk amongst ourselves. You have a sense of what we do. Stop. Did I stop sharing screen? Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. Um, I think maybe we'll hopefully we'll switch to gallery mode soon. Perfect. Wow. Okay. Uh, very inspiring to see uh, all of your work and then see all of it sort of in, in relationship to each other. Um, I guess the, the first question uh, is about the role of design, uh, spatial thinking and designers. Um, and so I, I see that within all your work, uh, it's amazing that there's an alignment between your aspirations of creating equitable futures. Uh, yet each of you approach your design interventions at different scales and from different disciplinary backgrounds. You're also all designers uh, very apparently, that uh, work outside of typical models of architectural practice. 
And so my question is, um, what led you there? What are your primary methods of approaching these issues and speaking and working with government agencies, the general public and community residents? And I see that, Kenny, uh, through your idea of arrangements and Keller through your idea of direct action and Billy uh, through the climate and community project in which you're overcoming data to uh, bring access of information to the community. Um, but if you'd like to speak to that. Jump in one of you guys. <laughs> I mean, I can, so there's not, there's less dead air on here. Um, yeah, do it, do it. Yeah, I mean, I think this is such a great question. And I think when we were chatting last week or the week before, you know, said something like we could spend the whole night talking about a version of this question. So I'll try to be really brief, but I think for me, like there's a few things here that have made some of this work possible. One is just that I have like a very different path to this job than other a lot of other people in our field. So I grew up in public housing in rural Arkansas, um, my first, few like professional-ish jobs or as an organizer. So working with you know, initially Dreamers in Arkansas and then others kind of in the Mississippi Delta side of Arkansas, uh, Arkansas side of the Delta. Um, and so just like brought it, you know, one, I think like that class perspective um, and then the kinds of folks who I'd spent my, you know, early twenties or so working with were just very different than folks who wind up in a design firm right out of a, a BR or a BLA or an MR or an MLA. And so in some ways, like, I can't imagine doing um, built environment or spatial or infrastructural work that isn't led by those same segments of either the climate or housing or racial justice movements. And for me, like a big piece of it is just recognizing that all of the like crisis sized visions for the future, all of the things that are actually scaled to the, you know, the scale and scope of the crisis are coming from those movement leaders. Um, and to like crib a little bit from Paul Wellstone, to also remember that people get organized because they have a vision for the future. They don't need us to like articulate a vision for the future. They, they have that, they're working towards that, they're going to win it. The things that we can offer are around how to give form and aesthetic and spatial dimensions to what are often an, an abstract set of demands. So going from decarceration and prison abolition, which is you know a cause at the center of a bunch of the studio work that I do here, to thinking through what are the specific sites, what are the specific investments in the built and natural environment that we can help visualize, we can help aestheticize, we can help um, otherwise sort of shorten the gap between that imagined future and reality um, through the kinds of things that designers do well anyway. So uh, there's lots more I could say about that. But that's like the short version of how I end up doing this thing. Uh, well, I, I suppose I, I, I'm a professor and writer and um, trying to work in a number of different communities, uh, uh, from the university community to using the written word to speak to a broader audience outside of architecture, um, to conversations like this, um, to try to make another place for spatial practices. Um, to, um, you know, I, I was joking when we were having uh, our conversations last week that sometimes I'm giving a lecture, kind of a pan university lecture, you know, to students who I feel are, you know, maybe they're priming to be like, you know, McKinsey consultants, you know, who are going to make decisions based on econometrics. And I'm, I'm trying to do a kind of counter brainwashing where but there's the spatial variables the irrationality of the way the world works um, is part is something that they feel they have to be responsible for. I, I feel responsible for knowing something about e economics and science and that, and I want space to be something that that not just my students, but the entire university understands as something that's important. It's also, you know, in our university cultures, uh, you know, puts a lot of credence on quantifiable proof. Uh, data sometimes only counts as the only kind of information. Um, so it's head, I'm making a case for heavy information, for uncertainty instead of quantifiable proof, for all kinds of mixing chambers and organs that uh, have unfolding work that are messy, uh, that we can work on together in different kinds of coalitions and partnerships. 
So that's a little bit of a picture of it. Want to keep moving or you want me to answer this one? Yeah, I'd love, I'd love if you answered it. Um, I'm trying to think of, I think, um, pose it again. Pose it again so I can make sure I'm, I'm getting it right. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the gist of the question is, um, what are your, your, your methods? Uh, what led you there? Um, and wh what's your approach of uh, speaking and working with government agencies, the public and community residents? Oh, oh, that's okay, 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 I have it again. So for us, it's about proposing um, an invitation to communities um, with enough of a, a scaffolding that we're talking about a real thing, but with enough openness that people can actually think into um, the thing that you're describing. So to give you an example, one of our, our big design research projects is called Public Kitchen. We pose the question, if kitchens are public, like schools or libraries, how would it change social life? But we put enough scaffolding up so that people actually can participate in something like a public kitchen, but not so much that it's determined. And, um, and from there, um, the invitation is to co-imagine it with us, to come play. And so um, that's how we tend to want to work across all of our different um, sectors and across all of our different actors. I think that way of working, gover government agencies get excited about it, but they find it scary. Um, I think um, um, residents love it um, and, and want to do more of it. I think it doesn't make as much sense to the, the thinking that made this thinking make sense to us and makes it make sense to each other in our bodies isn't, I, I think that there's a bit of a knowledge gap or a, a contextual gap for between us and the people who fund this kind of work. Like, I don't think it makes as much, like for us, it's like a no brainer, but I think for a lot of people who are interested in problem solving, this way of approaching social life is weird. And so I think, you know, one of the challenges we have is still trying to make you know, the um, techniques and processes for social imagination as a way towards um, social justice and social change, uh, a legitimate form of practice. Yeah, and it, it seems like from, from what each of you are talking about is that there's this, there's this other set of knowledge, there's this other, other set of practices and agency that's embedded within the community um, that we don't tap into often because it's not seen as quantifiable. Uh, I don't think it's even, it's not, the, the way in which our frames for what is knowable is organized doesn't make those ways of knowing intelligible. Um, I think I, I, I'm constantly saying like, at one level, it looks like we're fighting around silos, but at another level, we're fighting around knowledge, like we're in an epistemological struggle. Um, and, but it, it always looks like we're in um, a, a, a problem of, should we put resources here or there? But we're in a problem with how we organize the world um, mm -hmm. and, and how those ways of organizing knowledge then become legitimate as they become institutionalized and take on history and lives of their own. And the same can be said for other kinds of social arrangements. Like you think about the school as a social arrangement and you can sort of use the school as a, as a metaphor for epistemology. You know, the school is, the what we know about school is, um, encased in the institution itself. So the architecture, the chairs, the desks, everything holds the same patterns that were created, I don't know, 100 years ago. Um, so that, that knowledge is embedded in the practice. And I feel like the same, we're dealing with that same kind of armature in discourse, um, where you know the ways in which discourse are shaped um, and how knowledge and what gets to be known and what gets to be knowable. Um, I, I lost my train of thought, but I think you guys get where I'm going. I mean, one of you guys can help me out there. <laughs> no, it, it, well, Kenny and I kind of found each other, had this sort of siblings, uh, long lost siblings. And, uh, I know, it was like, both, that, I was like was this oh my book, God, I love Keller. And, uh, um, and I had also been- And now I love Billy too. <laughs> 
Um, uh, now I'm writing a book called, called Medium Design, which is also trying to express that something similar that, you know, culture is very good at, at pointing to things and calling their name or, or the quantifiable proof, but just not so good at describing the relationships between things or the repertoires that things enact, the difference that it makes that they are in this arrangement or that arrangement. Um, it's, and that is a huge, you know, it's still part of an old 500 year old sort of habit of mind that we're, uh, Still like trying to shed the separation, like the that enlightenment notion of things are separated and we know them by their separation, not by their relation. Yeah, we didn't. I didn't mean for us to go that far up the ladder. I'm <laughs> thinking, but well, I think maybe this kind of disconnects a little bit to the next question, which is about infrastructure. And I, I see this maybe this idea of of assemblages or um, mediums. Uh, maybe that's that this is the moment that we're in that we recognize uh, through climate change we recognize this connectivity we recognize the way that we're relating uh, to to each other in, in the world um, and so uh, the next question actually I'm, I'm jumping ahead but um, is that Boston like much of the US is faith, facing threats of climate change as in, and is in the process of planning major infrastructure projects. Uh, and during the last two years, we've also seen how marginalized communities are most vulnerable to environmental degradation and the consequences of climate change. Um, so I'd like to ask you, what can we learn historically from other cities and from our communities to make sure these investments are equitable? And how can design professionals uh, and others redress the interrelationship of community, ecology, and health in order to provide opportunities for regenerative design to take root and flourish. I, I just want to say we all let's let's take advantage of the Wu train. I think we just we have and across so many different terrains, particularly in Boston, we have new leadership that's really ready to do new work. And I think now the time we're at this moment where what we have to do is make the propositions and to show how, and they really show how they would work. The problem I think is that making propositions still costs money. <laughs> and so I just wish that, um, you know, we had more, more, um, uh, yeah, I wish that this work that we're interested in doing made more sense to, to um, the sort of philanthropic leaders and, and investment leaders, because I think we're really at a, a moment where, positing new ways of engaging the world. Here's the moment, we have it. How are you guys thinking about it? Well, I'll just say that, that last point, I think resonates so clearly with me. I cannot tell you how many funder conversations I've had where that end with them, you know, basically saying, sorry, but we have to find ways to like worry about the implementation of President Biden's FIP or BBB, whatever the hell like comes out of Congress in the next you know, few weeks. Um, including whatever passed last week. Um, and to like, basically as an excuse to say, we can't like, we can't suss around with these more radical notions anymore because now we have to get on with the serious pragmatic work of like building stuff, even though the stuff we're gonna build is actually pretty terrible. Um, and so I, I think, you know, this is where there's a couple of things that are, that are important here. One, I think is like connected back to maybe like the last moment of, of major or potential rupture in this sort of infrastructure building machine of this country, which is the New Deal. And the other is to look at some of the more recent kind of climate adaptation, climate resilience infrastructure work that's gone on. And on the New Deal side, I mean, I, I could obviously and have talked for like hours on end about it and I won't do that right now. But the thing to like remember about the New Deal is that contra to the way it's been mythologized, it wasn't really a top-down, heavy-handed, federally run set of programs. It was little more than a mass transfer of federal funds to state and local government for implementation. And what that means is that that money was basically a way of supercharging whatever power structure it found. So in cities like Minneapolis, it meant that super socialists who ran municipal government at the time got to lengthen and strengthen their control over the city, um, which to me sounds great. But also in the Tennessee Valley uh, and much of the South, Jim Crow Dixiecrats got to do the same. And this is the kind of contradiction of the New Deal and all of the compromises FDR and his colleagues made to ensure its passage was that 
it never grappled with and in fact often reproduced many of the worst like power imbalances and structures um, in this country, ones that we still have to live with today. And so I think when we think through what kind of investment on the climate adaptation, climate mitigation side, we're actually going to put our weight behind, it's gonna have to be a form of it that actually restructures and challenges existing power dynamics and not simply throws more money into existing systems. And I say that in part because if we look at just like the recent experience of climate adaptation work in the US, almost all of it is in some way connected either directly or indirectly, indirectly to luxury real estate development. Um, that has really predictable consequences around either ecological gentrification or just like straight up gentrification. Um, I think it's really hard for design firms to think through like the trade-offs there because they have real obligations that I don't have. I have the luxury of like swimming in a non-market academic pool and they have to like meet payroll and keep people on and keep the lights on. But I think for us creates like a real, a real challenging set of questions to think through what are the alignments that we want to build um, that can make their way into the profession over the next decade or so that can support a more just egalitarian build out of clean energy infrastructure, of climate adaptation infrastructure, uh, all the kinds of things that are embedded in calls for a red deal, a green new deal, a red, black and green new deal um, in ways that aren't just gonna simply uphold the status quo. Cause I think that's that's the likeliest outcome. And we have to think, I think really, really differently about how, how the next 10, 20, 30 years might go if we wanna avoid the fate of our kind of new deal predecessors. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, mean, I, you know, I in, in the New Deal research that I did, it was working on looking at kind of suburban multipliers um, and have been looking at multipliers ever since um, of many sorts. And now trying to think about how to shape some of the relational thinking we were, we were talking about a minute ago um, into some kinds of sturdy intermediate organs that can work at the level of community and also have the, a multiplier effect of some sort that, so that it you know, can address planetary issues at this moment of crisis. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of mentioned some of those that I feel most strongly about, but the thing that I, you know, maybe, you know, from, from thinking about uh, transportation, not just as a technology change, but as a, a rewiring of how transportation infrastructures interact with each other. Um, uh, and um, working on reverse engineering some of the multipliers of, 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 of sprawl and dispossession. I mean, I, I said, you know, if, if, if some of what we worked on was just rethinking the the holders of land uh, in alternative ways, the changes would be huge and um, they have potential multiplier effects. Um, so telling that story is really important, finding a way that some of these things can become as contagious as sprawl was contagious, but working in another way is, um, that's something we can do now. Again, don't need permission. We don't need legislation. I still think this is where frameworks like Divest Invest are especially important for us to like sit with and think through in the profession. And I don't want to spend like a ton of time on that, but I'll just say like this is the idea, right? That um, many of the most like noxious industries that we're talking about here, whether it's um, you know the carceral system, the fossil fuel system, whether it's the kind of exurban suburban real estate development, speculative real estate development system that, that Keller is pointing to. I'm also like very wary of this, like quantify everything and try to win an argument like it's a Scantron test way of working. But I think like that coupled with what Kenny and Keller are talking about can be like incredibly powerful. And I'm just going to pull it up really quickly and then take it down. But this is, you know, an image, this is a, a draft version of it. So it's not like the final thing, but coming out of um, a studio, my students are, are plowing through this, this fall, looking at the carceral system, uh, in the Mississippi Delta and trying to just show that, you know, this isn't a naturalized thing that emerged because it was the best fit for that region, which is a preposterous thing to say, but is said quite often, it's this thing that is actually heavily subsidized. It's the thing that policymakers at every level of government have decided is the economic development fix for the region. And, you know, to think through, you know, decarceration through this divest invest framework means probably thinking through ways to offer alternative kinds of economic development and investments in the built environment. And if nothing else, this gives us kind of a starting point for that conversation, something on the order of a billion or so in annual funding that 
um, would be newly freed up if we were to think about a sort of phase out of the system and a phase in of something else. But I feel like if that's going to happen, like one of the things like that we're talking about is we have to get um, a, a, a run on, on the kinds of um, Lego blocks for new forms of sociality that we think actually can lend themselves to, um, or at least give us a, a point towards the kinds of worlds that we think are, are worth um, doing. And I feel like you know, now is the time for us to really build those building blocks out and see them in relation to each other and what effects they could actually have in terms of improving who we become, like the kinds of subjects we become by virtue of being in proximity to say, you know, uh, a land trust, um, uh, a linked transportation system, um, housing that's actually equitable, there's a dance court in your community and you can walk um, and eat, you know, in lots of different ways with lots of different resources. Um, you become, you get to become someone else. So I, I think it's really important that we demonstrate that sooner rather than later. Well, luckily a lot of these, uh, a, a lot of these systems of real estate and incarceration and so on, fail and agriculture you know fail miserably you know they fail so miserably that um that there's ways to that that's a, that they, they the failure provides an opening for for us i think there was a question um how do i navigate the line between thinking through these larger theories and ideas and making them accessible to residents or non-designers that you work with how does this fit into larger conversations about environmental change in Boston? For us, a lot of it's been through direct demonstration um, of the projects we're talking about with communities. Um, so for Public Kitchen, we did it in, in Upham's Corner um, for 10 days, and then we ran it again for 14 days. And now we're trying to um, um, build them out where they can exist for years. So um, the, the, the building out and the demonstrating on the ground is the, the funnest and easiest part. It's the translating up and out um, and really fighting um, these other, um, like people who still believe that the grocery store should be our primary way that we get food um, and that individuals should stay individually responsible for their food procurement or their family's food procurement. And that when we talk about these sorts of uh, more um, egalitarian but practical notions around, you know, um, ways of distributing food and ways of distributing social life, people look at, you know, they're like, what the hell are you guys talking about? That's never going to make it past, um, you know, the policy or the um, regulatory doors. And we're like, we have to build the worlds we want and regulation has to follow. We can't ask, we can't, if we allow regulation to continue to determine the worlds we want, we'll never get the worlds we want. And so for us, the social justice fight is at the level of demonstrating the socialities we're interested in. And so the problem is never, the problem is never on the ground. The problem is always with these sort of um, gatekeepers who don't want who can't, who can't fathom and can't, I think some of it's even like beyond don't want, it's the nervous system. The nervous systems can't handle these worlds we're proposing. <laughs> yeah, this is such an important thread because I think often, right, we are, we are all at times constrained by like the blinders of like either the regulatory state Kenny's describing or like more broadly capitalist realism. Like what is possible tomorrow like constrains everything we do. And I think one of the like luxuries Keller and I have in academia, one of the like things I admire most about Kenny out in practice, also in academia, uh, is the ability to like think outside of those blinders um, and to like imagine with lots of partners like the ones we've talked about here, the kind of world we need and then to do what's called, you know, in sociology backcasting, right? To then think about the world we need and then what are the steps we need to get there rather than what can we do tomorrow and what kind of world does that leave us with? Which the answer to that question is a pretty grim one. Um, and I one that makes it is very hard to get people to fight for. So how do you think that you would um, communicate back to that 
professional world that is embedded within those uh, economic structures. Because I think maybe something that you guys have all been talking about is this idea of finance, financialization, um, the way that money kind of speaks to systems of power uh, without having to um, physically reorganize the world, right? Um, so when you work in an office, uh, you're already within a pre sort of pre-given uh, idea of the kinds of work that you can get um, your clients. Uh, and so how do we how do we sort of think about breaking out out of that within uh, within practice when we're when we're inside of it? Well, what, what I've been talking about is not really a client-based practice. I'm, I'm really trying even in the academy to allow students to rehearse, to train for um, another kind of practice. It may not be for everybody, but it's it, it working on even before leaving the university, making partnerships, uh, uh, getting grants. Um, the design profession doesn't have the multi-million dollar grants, but the sciences and and business and economics does. And they can they, you can start your career like while you're in school um, um, and think and 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 start to work uh, right away. Um, I mean, what, the profession is for our graduating students, you know, not so sustainable anyway. So, uh, and their labor not uh, valued in the way it should be valued. So um, th th there are alternatives uh, to that. And that that kind of work um, is hard. It's not easy. And you have to rehearse that way of banging on doors and making uh, different kinds of relationships. But I think it's also thrilling. And you know, rather than thinking of architecture studios as things that are done to do recitals for elder colleagues, we are doing recitals for the rest of the world. I think Billy is also doing that too for, for people who are, are the end users or might be the end users in the future of something uh, like this or who might be influencing at levels of policy and, uh, and activism. I think maybe I could connect that back to our uh, last question, which is on act activism and partnerships. Um, For one? So, yeah. I just to say before you do, can I also like jump on to Keller's point here? Of course. Yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, what if it is one thing I want to say like quickly on this question of like, what do we do in this context of everything being financialized? It's just one, recognize that all of that shit is fake. Um, like we're, we're being forced to provide like today, like a faux analysis um, of the Build Back Better plan, the climate bill from the Biden administration, days after we authorized a half trillion dollar defense spending bill with no such analysis or scoring, um, days after we passed, you know, a trillion dollar plus infrastructure bill with no analysis or scoring, uh, months after passing COVID recovery bills for trillions of dollars with no analysis or scoring that we were told would spike inflationary pressure and of course has not. Um, after being told, you know, a few months ago that it, we, it would be too technically difficult to enact a rent moratorium during the Obama administration and magically figuring out a way to do it a couple of years ago. Um, and that's all, all a long way around to saying that the right is very good at imagining the world that they want and then going out and building it. We live in their utopia actually right now. Um, the left has not done that kind of work, um, that kind of imagining and the kind of work that then goes into winning the world that's been imagined or just beginning to do some of that work now. And I say that because, you know, in all of the policy work that, that I get to be a part of, we get asked to provide kind of three things. One of those is the technical or economic case, which I think is very familiar probably to this crew for a particular idea. So thinking through the kind of green, the you know, public green public housing retrofits work that I've done with Daniel Adana Cohen and others, like have to provide the economic analysis to it, have to provide the moral sort of case for it, um, which is easy to do because public housing residents are making that for us. Um, and then third, have to center the right storytellers. And so for me, like thinking through those three tranches as we think through the kind of world we want to build becomes kind of an organizing device for this work. So practitioners are just gonna always be probably better suited to provide that first tranche, the kind of economic or technical analysis because there's real capacity there that's hard to find in the academy. Um, the other two are gonna come from other places. And so thinking through how we stack these different pillars together um, to engage in the kind of world building that Keller, Kenny and others have kind of talked about 
um, to me seems like one of the ways to get into that kind of work. Also, the, the thing about uh, the thing about the kind of community economies that we're talking about is that you know, like capital's so stupid. Uh, you know, like it, in 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 dumb econ, econ, economic terms, the kind of community economies that we're talking about overproduce. You know, they 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 redouble any value you give them. These community land trusts I was talking about have a you know a million dollar a year operating budget, and they make they make. Uh, um, in uncalculable value from from that, uh, because they're alive, you know, <laughs> and live things uh, are 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 not something that you can can calculate to either side of an equal sign. Well, we can go on to the next question, or we can uh, look at maybe the Q and A, whichever one you guys prefer. Um, Maybe I'll ask the last question. It's it's bringing it back to the to this idea of community. Um, so um, the question is, how can design professionals partner with communities to create meaningful work that benefits those communities and address critical issues? And how might design professionals engage in interdisciplinary collabor collaborations to address the complexities at the intersections of identity, place, and environment through art, activism, and policy? And I, I feel that you have <laughs> answered this question in many ways, but um, if, you, if there's anything you'd like to add there. I would say with us, you know, you could always come collaborate with us because we're already in the thick of it. So you won't have to worry about um, starting from scratch if there are people that are interested in playing in Boston and playing around some of with some of these sort of questions locally. We would make a lot of sense to <laughs> connect with because we're already situated at that intersection. Yeah, I just say everyone in Boston should go work with Kenny. That's the obvious answer. Um, no, it's not everyone. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, but the other thing I would say too, right, is that, um, you know, there are, so there are a couple of things. One is, again, just to kind of come back to this point that there, are, there's no shortage of radical and like interesting ideas about the future out there in either activists or advocacy groups. And so part of part of all of our jobs is to like better understand to Kenny's point earlier, like that kind of knowledge production, um, which like it's real knowledge production. It's in my mind, like equivalent to anything that comes out of any place like Yale or Penn or Harvard or whatever. Um, and that's why it's at the core of all the studio teaching that I do here. The other is just to think through um, you know, in addition to like thinking about how you how we pull how we like make ourselves useful to those groups, is to think through and practice like what are all the things that we we honestly like burn money on that could be redirected into the into the kind of trust and relationship building that we've been talking about or around most of tonight. And I don't mean that to say that like we should never do a design competition again. But we've done so many of them, right? Like those are often things firms engage in, knowing they have very little if any shot of winning. Takes tons of of you know person hours in the office to do. And those are all things that have like very low expected outcome or yield at the end of it, if anything. And that's the kind of work that could go into exactly what we've been discussing instead, right? To think about competitions less as a springboard to splashy PR or contracts or whatever it might be. And to think about that time and labor uh, as something that could be dedicated towards building trust and relationships with the folks who are gonna, you know, who are ultimately gonna be the ones who determine what kind of future cities like Boston get. It's not us. Uh, it's, Honestly, even though I love Mayor-elect Wu, um, it's not gonna be her. She's gonna do what she's kind of forced to do from below. And so thinking about how to make ourselves useful to those groups as well. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe that relates to one of the questions uh, from Ben that says, uh, what means do you prioritize to gather or create economic resources supporting vulnerable and disenfranchised communities? Uh, build capa capacity and value within communities, government at local, state, and or federal lef levels. Um, so yeah, how do we how do we create the the space, uh, both physical and uh, metaphorical space for for those those people and the resources? And I to think go back to PK like that project I was talking about, public kitchen. One of the things we found out is if you pose the right invitation, what you find is that the capacities are there and they um, they 
you just need the you need the right you need the right um you need right invitations um and ways to to allow people to self-organize themselves um to bring those those capacities out um and i think there are times where you know ideally it would be great to like you know like the first time we did public kitchen i think we we used about ten thousand dollars for um like a a 10-day um process ideally it would be great if we could have ran that for three months and at some point we could have been giving people in the community um um, pieces of um, like stipends to actually continue to play roles that they've imagined for themselves. So um, then you really are, it's a, you're like doing another level of getting people to invest in how they co-organize. Co but um, so I guess what I, I, I want to say is what we found is there's tons of capacity um, but the way in which we have to sort of organize our own procedures for engaging that capacity and, and respecting that capacity and then, you know, giving resources to that capacity, I think that stuff still needs to be thought through. And, and we still need um, ways to enact those kinds of experiments that, that haven't, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't found the, the kinds of philanthropic will to, to go along with those rides yet. But, you know, um, I'm, Billy's going to help me. I'm going to be bothering Billy. Like, I feel like he probably has a better, a better network of people who know how to play like, play like this. Is that true, Billy? Do, do you know the people who know how to play the way we want to play? We're going to find out after this, Kenny. <laughs> um, the other thing too, I'm always um, screaming about, um, and, and Keller has to hear me talk about this all the time, is I feel like with, with the opportunities like the infrastructure bill, like we've got to figure out how do we um, get some of that money for residents to practice building infrastructures that matter to them. And I, I don't know, it's a, again, it's a question for Billy, like if, if that, were, that train is passed and we and the money that's coming down the infrastructure pipeline may already be too taken up for what we already consider infrastructure, but I feel like where we can um, try to procure some of the re those resources for communities to practice infrastructure building on our own terms, I think it's, it's, it's um, that's, that's important as well. Um, but I, I, where I, I, I don't know is if practically, you know, there will be any, any um, wiggle room in the kinds of resources coming down a pipe. Yeah, I mean, it'll certainly be like not ideal. It's gonna be bleaker than we would have wanted. But if you look through the, the bill text for both the BIF and that, which has already passed the infrastructure bill, and then the BBB bill, the climate bill, which is not yet passed, probably won't pass. If it does, it'll be in like a very diminished form. Um, most of the money is pretty discretionary. So it's been left, a lot of the expenditure has been left up to cabinet secretaries to set rules, guidelines, criteria for, which means that there's gonna be a lot of opportunity at, state, at the state and local level to at the very worst, like gum up the works and stop really bad projects, um, which people should be doing. Um, and hopefully, I think to Kenny's point, to be able to redirect that money into the kinds of things that are being led by, imagined by, developed by community members. Um, but I, I think in some ways, like this, this underscores like the need to be engaged in these fights, not just like in periodic episodes, but like forever. Um, because one of the most important fights kind of of the Biden administration we lost in January, which was over this initiative that's been called J40, it's the Environmental Justice 40 Initiative, uh, it's, you know, it could have been something really spectacular in which 40% of all federal spending uh, could have had a set aside requirement that it be expended in, you know, defined frontline and fence line communities, environmental justice communities. Um, but the way that the final uh, sort of executive action was written, it went from 40% of investment to 40% of benefits, which means that now all of the accountants and like Wharton and BAs get to go to work thinking about how to creatively define something as a benefit. Um, and they're going to learn a lot from California, which has a version of this provision attached to their cap and trade law uh, and allows them to creatively count benefits to low income communities for things like 
um, de-risking assets owned by PG&E, like their electric utility. So they're for them, like they can count that as a frontline or fence line investment to like basically drive up shareholder returns for a private utility. Um, so anyway, I think like we've lost some of the most important fights. There are still many fights to be like waged within the, the implementation side of the BIF and BBB. And then, you know, but for, for better or worse, there's going to be no shortage of fights like this for as long as the rest of us are kind of doing this work. So um, at the very least, this is like good practice for future fights to come. Yeah, I mean, I, I, one of the things I was just trying to say in our remarks is that while, while yes, you know, direct action usually looks like fighting for legislation and it has a certain, I'm wondering if there are in, in, in this, uh, spatial language, another kind of direct action that we can think about that um, isn't making its case necessarily to the policymakers, but it's making its case to a broader public in ways that are mediagenic and, and you know, not, not even just, you know, the kind of neighborhood, whatever governance, but like out past that um, to, uh, to, other even make even more contagious um, at this moment of crisis. Uh, I'm, I'm just maybe a little impatient with um, the kinds of change that comes and the still the look, still the need for the the money shot or the or the uh, the shovel ready or even having to translate the idea of you know what is what is infrastructure. Um, uh, I, I think that that the communities that we are talking about know what it is, um, and that part of our job is finding a way to get out of their way and and get capital and policy out of their way. Uh, and I, I I don't know I I, I think there's stories to tell uh, to to a broad audience. I want to ask one more question, but we are go here. for it. Yeah, um, someone in the in the audience asked, um, "How have you collaborated with architects in these processes, and what made them unique or utter failures, or fantastic successes in Boston or elsewhere?" I think that's. I mean, that's that's interesting to think. You know, when did when when do these systems of trying to reach out fail, right? I mean, I'll just say I, I haven't had any. So Kenny's going to have a lot more to say. He actually works in Boston and on discrete projects. For for us in the climate and community project work, always have architects consulting on all of the sort of building side of those provisions. So on schools uh, and um, public housing, I've had folks like Steph Carlisle. Uh, she's at the Carbon Leadership Forum out in in Seattle, but was at Karen Timberlake for a long time, trained as an architect. Um, also had Sean Flynn, who's you know architecture lobby member um, based in New York works for somebody that's a lot of affordable housing development because there are just technical specifications that uh, and other kinds of work like that, that I don't have that nobody in my like immediate network of non-architects has the ability to do. And that often in the academy actually are missing. And so this is where practitioners provide just an incredible like body of knowledge to think through, um, you know, with, in, in that case, with the realization of retrofitting every single unit of public housing in the United States for not only deep energy retrofits, so lower no carbon emissions, but also to clean out the like half century worth of really shameful public health hazards in them, things like asbestos and lead and, um, you know, lack, lack of HVAC um, and all kinds of other things like that. So um, for me, those, com those collaborations have been really fruitful and I've been really grateful to, to a bunch of folks in the architecture community who've given time and, and labor and other things to this cause. And for us, we've mostly, mostly it's been industrial designers that have played with us. I think um, as we continue to collaborate with the design community, we'll probably, especially as it, um, if we get to take on more sort of advocacy around looking at the, um, God, I'm, I just went blank. Um, the city in Europe, Vienna, looking at the Vienna model as a, a kind of legitimate model for thinking about housing in the United States as we try to um, continue to move um, in those directions and reimagining public housing um, through the Vienna model in the United States. Um, those kinds of, if we can get the, that, 
like build work around those kinds of concerns. I think those would be places where we start to collaborate more with trained architects, but most of our collaborations have been like this. It's been like running workshops at BSA or doing talks about urban space or, so it's been, it's been sort of urban and spatial adjacent, but not direct with um, trained architects on a particular project. I would say that I, I wish, um, I mean, I, I'm not really the right person to respond to this, but I'm just taking a minute to say that I, that I think uh, um, the profession could do so much to encourage that moment right after our students graduate and have to face incredible debt and um, uh, end up doing, you know, kind of a pretty conventional course through the profession um, when that's not what they want to do. Uh, it's not what they want to do at all. <laughs> uh, and um, if the kinds of work we're talking about would count towards their internships and so on, uh, independent work where they're learning by leaps and bounds, by doing it themselves and making things happen, that would be, that would make a huge change uh, to the prospects of our students. And so I'm, 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 I'm making a little plea uh, for that to whoever's listening. I would love to continue this conversation, um, but I think we, we are exactly at time. Um, thank you all so much for this uh, wonderful conversation. It's so inspiring to hear you speak about this. Um, and I guess we will keep talking <laughs> in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thanks Have so much for having everyone. us. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.